There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. A dimension of sound. For the 150th time, you are not getting out of here. Please let me finish the Count of Monte Cristo. A dimension of sight. No change at all. What? I, I think I look fine. A dimension of mind. Next stop, the Twilight Zone. What's going on, everyone? And welcome back to the Fifth Dimension, a Twilight Zone podcast. I am your host, Nick, of course. And today we are uh, officially on our 10th episode. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I've decided to fire my co-host, who uh, apparently doesn't know how to belch anymore. So I've replaced it with this um, inanimate object of a cup and some extra headphones. And the person you see who's blinking is just there as a prop. So uh, without further ado, thank you so much for watching. Um, that's the end of the episode. Oh, wait, we actually have to talk about an episode. Um, actually, the person who is, I think, to my left uh, as you're watching this video is, of course, Triv from Trivial Theater. Triv, how you doing? We are um, very close to Halloween, I guess. You are putting out Halloween videos. I am putting out some kind of weird horrifying images i don't know but how are we doing tonight we're yeah, not doing too bad <laughs> I, I can actually oh that's okay uh it's 10 episodes in and i'm finally able to blink consistently which is pretty exciting i know next time uh we'll uh see like one finger pop up into the image like this you don't want that <laughs> <laughs> that actually sounded really wrong now i think about it but yes it did um... you should be ashamed of yourself i hope you end up in the twilight zone and end up in some goofy scenario i know i know i'll probably be in some scenario where i had to repeat this over and over <laughs> <laughs> i mean it can't be any worse than the fate of our poor guy tonight my god that that would suck yeah uh, well i mean as they say, damned if you do, shoot down a boat, damned if you don't. So, Dude, spoilers! Goes. Spoilers! <laughs> uh, he was on a boat wearing his flippy floppy, so he's good. So, <laughs> so Does he um, have a dick in a box? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Would you stop? It's not I've had box. a couple beers tonight. You know, it's my birthday, so I've had a couple hey, beers. I... Also, happy birthday. Even though this is going to come out next week, or last <laughs> week, or what current so, week that the, the day after halloween yeah, yeah. The day after halloween is that when it is yeah this or november 1st oh uh, yeah so this is our last episode of recording of october it's uh pretty crazy to think about you know we've been filming we see october 18th or, so this episode last episode came out on my birthday which i didn't even think about but we've been recording since august i think yeah thereabouts so, for the first of yeah. september two and a half months so, that's crazy how you got how you feeling about this uh crazy old podcast so far i think it's pretty good i mean yeah. i'm just excited to be able to be here and actually blink although i still wonder what's in this cup i really need to figure that out maybe it's some um, apple cider since it's fall i really don't know well, i mean possible i mean when this episode airs it's uh gonna be christmas time so maybe it's like white claw <laughs> mixed with uh bear juice so we'll just call it white bear you know okay now now you're getting off track into other areas <laughs> that we can't talk about until we talk trivia so i know you're kind of, you're know. Kind of I'm, going I'm, off I'm, the rails really early <laughs> well i mean when you don't drink beer very often it's like you you go off the rails pretty quickly i had, I had too much stella tonight so <laughs> stella! yeah that's what i said when i was down i was like stella <laughs> how could you stella. say stella and yet like shotgun a beer that's pretty impressive uh, I know, right? Especially like a beer like like this this big, I think it was. <laughs> <laughs> so oh, a normal man. pub glass, basically? Yeah, so like, you know, for real positive, it'd be like a normal beer for me. It's like eight beers at once, you know? Dude, you are such a lightweight. I could drink I, you I, under I, the table, and I don't have Everybody could drink me under the table. <laughs> my, 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 my young sister could probably drink me under the table. And I don't know. She, she drinks. So. <laughs> so, oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah. So this of course is a Twilight Zone podcast where we talk about Rod Sterling's iconic franchise and series. And today we're talking about season one, episode 10, which of course is called judgment night. Uh, before we actually begin, remember we are on YouTube as well as audio podcasts, which are like Stitcher and SoundCloud and Google play and Apple, uh, Apple, 
podcast or whatever they call themselves. And uh, if you if you like to listen to audio format, please rate, subscribe, stars, all that good stuff, so we can get kind of some kind of you know uh, following. I guess you could say is the easiest Yay. way to put it. So yeah. We're available um, for fine podcasts or where you listen to fine podcasts. I know. If uh, if you can flatulate it, you know, fart it out, you can listen to it there too, I guess. So. Uh, I'm pretty <laughs> sure that that's not a thing. <laughs> it may be. It may be. I mean, um, maybe so- five years down the road, but I don't think we're quite there yet. Not even the Twilight Zone talk about that kind of awesome technology. Oh, man. Can you imagine if Ross suddenly found out fart technology? It'd be amazing. <laughs> fart book. <laughs> <laughs> So this episode is directed once again by John Braun, uh, who's directed, I think, one or two episodes by now. It's written by Roz Serling. This has no actual composer, which is interesting. It's the stock stock music they use, which whatever. Um, you know, it only they can only use so much of a composer, I guess. You know, yeah. you don't have. I don't think Bernard Herman's coming back anytime soon, which is kind of interesting. They also use stock video too, so it's stock music and stock video. Yeah, I guess they uh, felt the last episode was like, "Hey, we're good with stock footage. Why don't we just keep using more and more of that?" Because we don't, we're gonna we're gonna do what Family Guy does now, where they don't actually have actual. They just use whatever they have available to them, I guess. But the production code is one seventy three thirty six zero four, which is the oh, fourth wow. episode ever filmed. Which you know, watching this episode, it kind of has that feel of like a early episode recording, just in the nature of like it's all it's really grainy i know it's shot you know at night with a lot of fog but it's it feels like it has a lower quality than something like perchance a dream which is really interesting when you kind of watch it it feels like maybe they honed their techniques as they were moving it along because perchance a dream was a much later episode recorded so i don't know i was really interested to see that when i was watching it, it doesn't make you know the episode which i'm not we're gonna talk about i'm not like was not the biggest fan of watching it as i was complaining about it uh but <laughs> This is the first episode of December. It premiered December 4th, 1959. So we are, I want to say, two episodes away from the new decade of 1960, which is pretty crazy. Um, it only took about 11, 11 or 12 episodes to get there. So it looks like they skipped a week or two for you know holidays and stuff like that. But yeah, fair. So with this episode, as we always do, did you, Triv, did you know much about this episode going in? Have you, is it been, like one, this is one of the episodes that, I kind of remember, but I don't remember watching that type of thing. I kind of remember it, but I don't remember when the last time I watched it. It's not, you know, an atypical Twilight Zone episode. Did you do you agree with that, or how did you go going into this as like starting point? I remember watching it, but like as soon as he popped up on screen, I I knew it was going to happen from watching it previously. But mm-hmm. had you said, "Hey, do you remember this specific episode?" I would have said uh, maybe. Like I really don't. I really wouldn't have off the top of my head remembered it yeah like you know um, it it's got some imagery that's pretty like you know it when you see it but to mm-hmm. just be told about it it's kind of like eh. well it's, a, it's an interesting episode because it really does feel like a twilight zone episode especially with the ending mm-hmm. but going into it not really remembering very well i didn't really have a frame of reference until you, you told me that it was familiar to another tv show's episode And I remember that episode pretty well. So I kind of had an inkling where this episode was going to go. But the way it plays out, and we'll talk about it, I just, I I don't know. I was really kind of, maybe we'll talk through it. Maybe we'll kind of get a better concept and idea. And we probably won't go as deep as we did with Perchance the Dream, because I don't really feel that this episode has, yeah, yeah, a lot as much. Yeah, I feel like it has some interesting concepts and theories of stuff that I really enjoy. But I think what's weird about Perchance the Dream is it was so, I I miss a lot, but it felt so philosophical in a lot mm-hmm. of stuff it was saying. Here is just about a man who has some weird feelings about why he's on this boat. There's something truly off about the character. And I don't know. I mean, once again, did you go into this episode thinking you were going to like it? Or do you, do you ever go into these episodes going, I mean, based off the synopsis that maybe this isn't for me? I mean, do you ever go into Because there's some episodes where I like read the synopsis and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to feel about this. And they end up being a little bit better than what I thought they were going to be. Mm-hmm. But do you agree at all with that? Um, I, because of the kind of movies I review most of the time, I try to keep an open mind as much as I can. Yeah. Um, there are some like, honestly, for Twilight Zone, like the space based episodes, they kind of all mull together for me. 
and I know that's not, there are a lot of great episodes that, that deal with, with space travel, but yeah. you know, if you set down five episodes in front of me and one of them was a space episode based on that, I wouldn't necessarily for, pick it first, but by and large, like if I look through a synopsis and I'll just be like, Oh, okay, we'll see what it brings. Because like, even as we've talked here, there were some episodes that going in, you know, it's kind of like, okay, well, here we go. I walked out of the episode, not thinking much of it, but then, you know, we get talking and that kind of changes the way I feel about it. So. Yeah. It's, it's really interesting when you think about it, because, you know, we, I'll go into something like elegy, which is, we'll talk about that. We're gonna have a, a guest on for that episode. Woo-hoo. I like, <laughs> I like it. It's a space episode. It has a really interesting premise, but I think I start sometimes gravitating to the episodes that aren't as thought provoking as mm-hmm. some of the episodes. And then when we get into the thought provoking episodes, it brings up a new interesting dichotomy for me as a person when it comes to Twilight Zone, because as you and I have talked about Twilight Zone, I consider one of the greatest TV shows of all time. And when you go into an episode like this and it's about this guy having this weird issues, I, I don't know. It just didn't really seen that interesting to me i mean we're gonna talk about it. the next episode we're gonna talk about is another kind of spacey plane type of episode and i don't know it's this is a really strange episode i don't really know uh, when we get to the end of it we finally kind of break it down and how we feel about it i like parts of it but i don't like a lot of it so that's just my honest opinion but yeah. um do you have anything else you want to say on it before i actually start the actual plot i i kind of feel like this episode it, it is an odd one because you do kind of yeah get the idea that there's obviously from the start there's something wrong it it puts it out there a little strongly to start with like and i understand like if you had that feeling of dread getting on a plane or a boat or a train or whatever and it doesn't go away and you start to see things and deja vu and all that stuff that feeling of unease i don't know it, it did hit a weird nerve and i don't i can't tell you for sure why like i don't have an honest reason as to the 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 basis for that feeling and maybe it's just because you you kind of see where it's going, but then you think, oh God, all those poor people, even if it's just a show, there's still that foreboding of, okay, this guy is going to, you know, what happens at the end, it's going to keep happening and happening and happening. Like he has no chance of getting out of it because of yeah. something he did in life. Like it took him until this to realize what he did. And as soon as he figures out what's going on, that sense of dread, you know, that, that he's, he's doomed to that. And I don't yeah, know, maybe that's what sits with it. Like that it's, it's well, existential maybe. And the thing I like that with deja vu, which is what this episode has that feeling of is there's been a, there's been a kind of interesting concept that's been pushed out there the last couple of years about when we have deja vu, deja vu is usually like the last time we remember that specific thought or idea Mm -hmm. so it feels like there's a lot of deja vu going on in this episode which is a really interesting kind of concept of what the episode is trying to deal with as well as dealing with your as we'll learn i don't want to spoil anything if you haven't watched this episode before if you had you know you definitely know where it's going but there's a lot of like dealing with you know humans the the soul of a human and how they perceive themselves and what causes our, our regrets i guess you could say what we'll talk about that when it gets there but it's more than our regrets it's it's the actions that we you know words yeah. versus actions i mean the, yeah anyway yeah no no you're absolutely right it's the the things we do it's the cause and causality as it, as it seems to be in a lot of these episodes is the things we do affect you know if i were to go buy something and then i couldn't pay my rent I shouldn't have bought that thing. It's the cause and yeah. you know causality of that type of, which right. is a little, little less straightforward than what you know. Right, but the same basic idea. But with that said, this episode has a lot of people in it. For the first time, we actually have a pretty not not necessarily you may not know who they are, but a pretty stacked cast of characters. Um, the main character, of course, is played by uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah Persoff, who is a Jewish mm-hmm. actor who, still, as you said to me earlier, is still alive at 101 years old, which is crazy. Yeah. And so, in this episode, uh, he plays as a, as a Jewish man, he plays a Nazi officer. Yeah. Which, well, well which is really interesting because uh, how he, you know, how his character plays out, but you know, he's, he played, uh, as you said, Papa Maskowitz in American tale, which mm-hmm. is kind of cool. And um, cool. we have Ben Wright who plays Captain Wilbur, uh, Patrick McAnee plays the first officer, James, uh, Fran, Francis, Franciscus, I guess that's how you say his name. 
plays Lieutenant Moeller. Hugh Sander plays Potter. And the last of the main characters, because there's a lot of other characters that are more tertiary, is Leslie Bradley as Major Devereaux. So, um, like, so there's there's a lot more cast. There's like young kids and stuff like that in this episode. But there's whole families, really. Yeah, exactly. There's like one particular family that plays an important part in the story. Um, but this episode basically opens up with uh, a really interesting narration from Rod Serling, which it feels like he is doing a play more than anything. Is he has a really in- different cadence when what he's known for doing, which is kind of already offsetting the episode, kind of pushing the episode into a weird territory of, you know, making you feel uneasy and uncomfortable. Like I said, we see the ship, it's in fog and, you know, grainy blackness and stuff like that. We see, of course, uh, Lancer, as he's called through the episode, basically on the boat, kind of staring off into the, the distance. But um, the narration reads, this is a lot, this is a lot, this is a huge narration, actually, but he, <laughs> but he says, uh, her name is the SS Queen of Glasgow, which I thought he said Glasgow, but he says Glasgow, <laughs> uh, Glasgow, actually, um, her registry, British, gross tonnage, 5,000, age indeterminate. At this moment, she is one day out of Liverpool, her destination for New York, uh, New York City, New York. Uh, duly recorded on the ship's log is the sailing time, course to destination, weather conditions, temperature, longitude, and latitude. Which is really interesting that he's like naming off the boats, kind of you know, ticks and stuff like that. Which I don't know if he's really being specific, but he's like, Here's this boat, it says, Here's what it's doing. We're gonna read beneath this guy. So, um, but what is never recorded in a log is the fear that washes over a deck like fog and ocean spray, fear like the throbbing strokes of engine pistons, each like a heartbeat parceling out every hour into breathless minutes of watching waiting and dreading where the year is 1942 and this particular ship has lost its convoy it travels alone like an aged blind thing groping through the unfriendly dark stalked by unseen periscopes of steel killers yes the queen of glasgow is a frightened ship she carries with her a premonition of death that's a lot of dialogue so how many breaths did that take a lot a lot as you can tell i was like um but okay so we we see carl lancer in this we also see like the i want to say he's like the major d or whatever i don't know exactly who it is but concierge um, yeah concierge or something like that this this opening is making the ship seem like um an entity a kind of vessel that's being uh kind of piloted through something unknown or tragic or whatever but it's making the ship out like it's almost something breathing living and kind of uh dreadful in a lot of aspects but is there anything that you gathered that maybe i didn't say or what do you think of the kind of opening narration of rod serling the fog i think plays a dual role in this and i know that's not quite mentioned in the narration as much Mm. but it does like the fog itself kind of becomes a living breathing thing as well um but yeah the the ship it's the way the script the ship is described is really super interesting yeah, I don't know if any of that's um, kept keepable. I apologize. <laughs> no, it's fine. It's it's um to me personally, it feels like the ship is kind of like um without spoiling anything, it has a have particular reason for what it's doing, and maybe the ship is uh, uh we'll we'll get to. It. I don't want to spoil anything till we get to the end. Yeah. Um, but this episode, at least in the first half, and. It's very simplified as a storytelling. It's this guy, Carl Lancer. He's constantly staring into space like he's for, like something is amiss about him. He constantly is as like questioning his reality, he's constantly questioning who he is. He's constantly questioned by like the the stewards, stewards or the captain and stuff like that. And he they ask him like are you heading home or leaving home? He says heading home. He seems to have an awful lot of knowledge about U-boats. He seems to have an awful lot of knowledge about, you know, the inner workings of ships and stuff like that. And it's a very, it's a very interesting pace, but not necessarily the most fascinating of segments. But listening to this character go through his motions on being just really confused and really kind of out there, not really knowing who he is, or he knows who he is, but he's like almost has like a weird amnesia problem, which is uh, what the female passenger says. What was your overall take on this first act? Because like I said, it's mostly just him kind of questioning what is going on, but not really sure about what's going on. Did you have any kind of idea that where it was headed or did you have any, you know, what do you think about the kind of the first act and kind of anything you wanted to add to that? 
Well, I think that they did a pretty good job of, you know, the, the questions that he's asked are just kind of small, small talk questions, even yeah. though they, they do have a greater significance in the grand scheme. Uh, Sterling did a really good job of kind of writing it as, okay, people are just asking him general questions, the kind of things that, you know, it, it's, I don't, I don't know how big the ship is, but I'm sure like if you spend what is probably at least, you know, five or six days on a boat, you get to know the people around you. And yeah. clearly just given by the size of the dining hall, that wasn't that big of a ship. So you do kind of like, oh, well, you didn't join us for dinner, you know, <laughs> da, 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 this, you know, you know, tell us about yourself kind of a thing. You know, you get to know the folks that are around you because you're stuck with these people. And in his case, he's really stuck with these people. That's the funny part. Like he's on a, all these people know who he is or know each other. But there's something that like feels very strange and off about Lancer. It feels like they have no idea who this guy is. They're constantly questioning. You know, you go into a situation where you have this weird ass dude who just seems to be really off. He seems like he's maybe on drugs or something like that. And he just he's constantly just like questioning and like you ask him questions and he feels like he's, you know, thinking about like the next uh, next, I don't know, band he wants to go to see or something like that. <laughs> And it's just, it's really kind of just a strange thing. It's almost like they know who he is based off the ending, but it almost feels like he's being tested. He's being questioned and he's being given some kind of sanity test. I guess you could say it's really, it's really a strange, like I said, I, but when the episode ends, I honestly understood what they were going for, but it's just like, I never felt really connected with Lancer's character. I never really was connected with these people. It feels like I was in, in, in a place where it just was trying to make me unsettled and unease. And I, I don't know. I just, I couldn't get on board with that at all. I, as we were, I mean, we both watched the episode together because before mm-hmm. we started recording and I, as you heard, I was complaining a lot. I just, <laughs> there was so much about this like weirdness to his character about how he talked and, you know, how he felt like a thespian in a world of t- t- television actors. And, you know, I, I get that his like confusion is just kind of playing off where the ending goes, but I don't know. I'm talking, maybe I'm talking in circles. I mean, does that make any yeah. sense to, I don't I know. I think so. I, I think, you know, that, that sense of disconnectedness, I think it does mm. relate to him as a character though. Like, he's disconnected from everybody around him, you know, like he's kind of away from the rest of the group in every way possible. And given yeah. the time that it takes place, which is 1942, the middle of world war II, sailing mm. between London and New York and, you know, their, um, their escort, uh, the ship that had kind of been with them to kind of protect them from U-boats had been lost in the fog or had to turn back or something. So, yeah, I mean, it, that sense of unrest and, kind of just not paranoia so much as just like you're on your own you know you're in the middle of this fog wandering and i think that sense of disconnectedness does work here in that respect like we're not supposed to know who carl lancer is because he doesn't know who he is uh, i know I, it's just it's so weird uh, it's weird like when you talk about it because it makes sense but sitting on like my side of the kind of box it, like if we were going like a debate or something like that mm-hmm. You know, I would just talk about how, you know, just there's something. There's something missing. It's really, yeah, it just feels like there's something missing from his character. And I think what I, I think what ends up happening is I feel like the so much information is left for the second half or the second act of this episode mm-hmm. that the first act just doesn't feel like it stands strongly with what it ends up being. And I felt the I felt the ending was so fascinating, so unique, even though it, there's an episode that we'll talk about that has a mirroring thing with a, like a current TV series. Mm-hmm. But it's just like once the reveal happens, once we find out why, why Lancer has like like some partial amnesia, I, I don't know. I just felt like there was something like missing in Rod Stone's storytelling or his use of a character that feels it was kind of strangely off in a lot of places. But like I said, like you said, there are points where you maybe sometimes you have to leave information out to kind of conclude your story. And it's just, I don't know. I'm really, I'm really kind of torn on just this whole concept, I guess. No, that's okay. I mean, that's the thing about mm-hmm. any of these mo- or any of these episodes, there's two mm-hmm. sides of, you know, a story, you get two people looking at it. 
you can have a hundred percent different opinions on on what it is and what it means i mean that's why uh, we review movies and tv shows and everything else so there's nothing wrong with no that. i know yeah i know and we're gonna have our disagreements on these <laughs> episodes i'm sure oh uh, knockdown know, drag out is coming i'm telling you oh, i'm sure it's gonna be on the episode we least expect <laughs> look you inv- i'm looking at you invaders we're gonna have a knockout drag out about invaders oh hell yeah i'm bringing my <laughs> shovel i'm gonna leave it in the background that way it constantly reminds you and then you piss your pants because you're so scared of my shovel i'm bringing my 16 millimeter shrine Dude, I'm not scared of your 16 millimeter shrine. I have lived both that and Sunset Boulevard. Uh, yeah. I survived yeah. things, damn it. You can't, you can't touch me. <laughs> yeah, man. So we'll, we'll move past that. I don't know how long this episode is going to be, but there's not a, like a huge amount, you know, discussion or whatever. Well, probably not. I, I mean, there is and there isn't. The, the, <laughs> the story, the thing about this story is it is incredibly simple. Like, the, the, mm. there's not a lot to it. You know, guy finds himself we open on him on a boat um the rest of the the people are asking him questions that he can't answer or he progressively as he goes along can answer a little bit but he can't answer a lot of the questions that they have that seem like very simple questions like he knows where he was born he weirdly has a lot of knowledge about u-boats he's german he knows his name so that's really all we get yeah yeah and it feels like like i said we'll go we'll talk about when but anyways we come back from break. Um, well, I can't to remember talk about before. the break. To talk about the break, he's in the he's in the um, the captain sends one of the stewards down. Oh, to help okay, him this unpack. happens before the break. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. Um, That's okay. He, he get, no, no, but you're right. So he comes back. He, he, the 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 captain questions him about how he knows all the U boat stuff. Then they send a, a steward or whatever down to work with him or to help him out to unpack. Yeah, to help him unpack, and they find a. Uh, uh, a captain's hat or whatever mm-hmm. and it has german writing inside of it it says like uh carl lancer and has his name i think i'm assuming like his status and rank in yeah. german and stuff like that and he starts to, he starts to go like he realizes like it almost comes to realization what's going on or and, at least um, a little bit i don't think he 100 yeah. percent knows at that point but another thing that happens earlier on is he's found so he said that he had been in england and he doesn't like he finds himself on this ship and the captain questions him about his passport, which he doesn't, for some reason, have on him. Right, right. Which is a, a pretty big tell. You know, passports are a must on a ship. So why would a guy be on a ship without a passport? That's really telling if you think about it. But yeah, anyways, he sees a hat and he kind of... And, and, but now, um, as it comes back, he uh, he starts to like be really... He starts to go more and more unhinged, I guess you could say, when he is they're the captain and they're on the deck they're on the where they steer the ship and stuff like that and <laughs> i forgot the before the commercial ends but you talk about that guy with the he looks like he needs like a beer or something because he looks so bored the guy's steering <laughs> yeah. the boat um, he totally does <laughs> <laughs> the guy steering they, the uh, ship has this just totally like deadpan look on his face he looks like he's just yeah. bored as hell yeah it's pretty funny he's like they're paying me a they're paying me two bits to be a, a fake ship boat captain. Where's my beer, you know? <laughs> oh, I got shanghai man. <laughs> I woke up on this boat and I don't know why. But it, it's really it really interesting because we come back to the episode. And of course, like I said, the captain and his shipmates are on the, the deck of the boat, you know, steering the ship. And they talk about, I don't know if they talk about trying to get there quicker, but they end up being, they end up worrying about the uh, overworked engines and stuff like that. And, Lancer, who was doing his best Jack Torrance, drinking drinking his life away, <laughs> talking to what who like Graves or whoever that guy is in the uh, the bar. Basically, at twelve oh five a.m., the ship shuts down and it freaks out Lancer's character, and he starts having some kind of tick or whatever you want to say about time at one fifteen. He panics. Now, yeah, he starts panicking. He starts like running down the hallway, screaming like a banshee uh, out of hell. You know, like a crazy person i guess you could say and he starts seeing like he sees like the family and then the family disappears and then all of a sudden people are like not there which is really strange because people have seemed to disappear Mm -hmm. and then they kind of reappear but i was going to ask you is this guy starting to unravel is he starting to have a nervous breakdown not knowing what the ending plays out what did you think of his kind of like unraveling did you think that was making the story 
better? Was there was it starting to kind of give you questions like where do you where do you come out of that whole segment? Because it really is kind of a just guy just completely just going insane and not knowing the ending. You have no idea what's actually happening. Yeah. I, I kind of like looking at so he runs down a hallway and he runs across like the family and like he starts screaming at them to get to the lifeboats and he threatens to start pulling people to the boats and mm. that right there and they, there's no there's no no emotion on their faces they're just kind of deadpan staring at him and it really yeah. feels like the textbook definition of screaming into the void like mm. that's really what I came to um as far as his mental state at that point, I think, yeah, he totally comes off as deranged. Like he's seeing people that aren't there, but then you wonder, yeah. oh, maybe they are there. And there is that sense of there's something clearly not right. And it's more than just with him. So. And now actually, if you want to, you can kind of explain what happens next because it becomes apparent that something is about to happen to this guy that is going to completely wide open the situation but i don't know if you want to talk about sure. what exactly happens yeah go, go, go so, right ahead. okay so he goes up on the deck and he looks off into the distance and there's there's a there's a floodlight that he sees through the fog and mm-hmm. it's a pretty bright solid light and he's trying to hide from it and even i doubt through the fog they'd be able to see him but then finally he gets a set of binoculars and looks and there's a there's a u-boat in the distance getting ready to fire on them like big guns and everything and he looks at the the guy that's the cap wearing a captain's hat and it's him bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> that that I, I actually kind of saw that coming just a little bit because um of the episode you told me about and something else i was thinking about but real quick i was gonna say um when the when the u-boat likes like the 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 military the men are coming down they look like they're coming down like a jungle gym like how they they're do. just like <laughs> crawling down ropes and stuff like that i thought that was i mean it's, it's whatever with the episode but yeah so yeah he sees himself basically and they yep. they um it's pretty crazy now that leads into uh basically the firing upon the boat and that's when yep. all hell breaks loose uh people start dying people start um there's a point where a woman burns alive not like you don't really see her burn alive but there's a lot of fire and she's she's in stuck hole. in a you see her through yeah you see her through a porthole and there's fire all around her like shit mm-hmm. blows up all over the place yeah this is where you see all the stock footage basically most of the stock footage in the episode and it basically if you see where this story is going as you said you've already knew about this episode this is a telltale sign that there's something that Lancer did as a U-boat captain that he's reliving. Absolutely. So yeah. uh, you see they, they blow the ship to kingdom come mm-hmm. and then you see them diving and then you've got stock footage of, of, of guys on a submarine, like doing their thing. Yeah. They're on a submarine. They're on a submarine. They're on a they got their flippy floppies. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then they go to the captain's, or the captain's room and uh, or his ready room and he's sitting there like tallying up oh well you know we we sunk this this 5,000 passenger ship and um back during world war ii that was a big thing like the tonnage or the the amount of people on the ship they kept records of that and it was always kind of a contest to see who could you know get the most people or the biggest votes and his i'm uh-huh. guessing second in command uh-huh. opening narration yes That's exactly what you just said I was exactly. waiting for you to see if anybody would say that. that's exactly what you're saying. But anyways. Uh, so yeah, the the um the second in command, I think, is the other guy. Yeah, I want to say yes. I, I kind of like lost track of who was what in this. So. Yeah. Well, I we only see him guy. in this one scene. So yeah, and he comes in <laughs> and he's kind of twisting his hat in his hands, and uh Lancer or Lancer goes, Ah, you've got nerves, and the guy basically says do you think about the people you know that was a ship we didn't we didn't give them any warning we just fired on them and and killed everybody and i mean from a from a practical perspective you wouldn't want to you know let loose your position because if you you know signal to them that you're going to fire they're going to you know say hey these guys are firing on us help so there is that sense but he basically says you know do you believe that there's a place in hell essentially for people that do this kind of thing i mean he's essentially saying it's a cowardly thing to do and you know will we be you know 
punished for it. And there's that sense of, he's like, you know, what if, what if, and I think he brings up the idea that he heard stories or there was something about, you know, reliving something about reliving the day or that event over and over and over again. And I don't Which, remember if it was a story or if it was something like, you know, I heard about a circle of hell that deals with this or, or how it's stated. Yeah, which which brings up what we were talking about near the, the beginning of the episode about regrets and the things you do and the thing, how you act can uh, ripple, ripple yep. and oh, cause, massive uh, ripples. you know, for instance, if I were like, go back in time and destroy that butterfly, how would the effect <laughs> and causality you know, we'd probably be doing like a Twilight Sparkle Sparkle podcast or something oh, like God. that. Oh, you God. Know? No! <laughs> but, but then you see what's really interesting is you see Lancer's face all of a sudden turn to horror. Like, yeah. he, his face just like droops because he just doesn't give a shit. He's like, I don't care, blah, blah, blah. The, his second command's like, we have to think about our, our, you know, though they are our enemy, we have to think about what we do and how it affects our, the long run they saw us what you know whatever you, what you were talking about and we realized that this guy is going to I, I don't know if it happens at this point or it'll happen in the future where he'll probably be killed he'll probably be killed or something like that and then through some act of twilight zone nature through the act of god himself if you believe in that kind of thing he will basically and this is actually very prevalent like the dark tower story the stephen king story where at the very end roland the this chain the gunslinger relives the story but just in a different way but he relives it over and over and he basically rematerializes at the beginning of the story on the ship that he was on the glasgow ship reliving the same thing over and over so it's like it's like if they they made in stay tuned they made your own personal hell story it was that type mm -hmm. of thing and it's um really a scary thing it actually made me really just like think about my life sometimes about am i making the right choices am i going to die and not necessarily if i believe in that kind of like afterlife type of thing but if i were to die and this were true where would I be placed in my, that moment of time where I'm reliving the same kind of scary thing over and over? And would my thinking and beliefs and so on and so forth affect that situation? And I don't know if you agree, but I, I think that's what he Rod Stone was trying to go for. Just the act of oh, yeah. be careful what you do, because it will definitely come back to bite you in the ass at some point, whether it be future, past, present, however it works. So. I mean, there's always that you are responsible for your actions, regardless yeah. of whether you believe in heaven, hell, you know, the variations on that across religion, whether you have your own personal code. I, I think that it is, you know, if you do, if you do things, whatever you do, you know, you'll be mm. punished or praised accordingly. I think there, there is always, you know, even karma, you know, however you believe there is repercussions is basically what it comes down to. Yeah, I mean, I'll be straight and honest. I am not a believer of a lot of things, but karma is definitely one thing I believe because I've seen it happen. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I've seen karma happen where I've either done something or I've seen somebody else do something and it come back to bite us in the ass. That's all I'm yeah. going to say. No, understood, so, understood. Yeah. But what I thought was interesting about this film or about this, about this episode, <laughs> and we talked about this, and I actually explained the episode to you, is there's a lot of it's funny how people are very inspired or very uh you know they they bleed off certain episodes from shows they like for instance you know uh, charlie brooker is i'm sure a huge fan of the twilight zone that's why he created black mirror but if a lot of people have seen black mirror a lot of people i know you haven't but i know a lot of people have and white bear is one of the most controversial episodes in the series but it has a mirroring segment to this episode based on how the story plays out what exactly the young the woman um uh, leonora critchillo however you say his name say her name how her story plays out is very similar to what happens in this episode and i thought it was kind of interesting because i never i never even thought in a million years when i was watching black mirror especially with like play tests in this episode that they're very inspired whether they did it intentionally or not from something like Twilight Zone. So watching an episode like this makes me appreciate it a little bit more. It doesn't mean I like the episode that much, <laughs> but 
I just thought that was interesting. I thought it was interesting that Judgment Night has some inspiration possibly to, you know, other stories. Because there are other stories that deal with, oh, you yeah. know, somebody caused problems, somebody's reliving that problem. Like I said, Dark Tower has a lot of that motif. I know I am pretty sure that Stephen King's a huge uh, uh, Rod Serling fan. And um, I don't know. It was, it was just interesting. It doesn't mean yeah. make it for anything like different, but I just thought that was kind of fascinating. So. Oh, no. Well, and, and Twilight Zone, you know, for it was, I mean, anything can have a cultural impact. You could have a show that runs a season and it has like a massive cultural impact on the people that watched it. And that kind of goes down through the ages. With your, yeah, a hundred percent. It mm. It is very much that. I mean, that it all kind of relates back. And Twilight Zone in itself is such a cultural phenomenon, both then and now. I mean, if you take if you take the time to watch any episode from then, so many of them do transcend. You know, you whether you're whether you're the the messages don't change because by and large people don't change. Technology changes, the rest changes, fashion changes, but people don't. So yeah, I mean, Twilight Zone in its nature is about human condition human like keep saying it but it's about human conditions about human psychology is about what's right what's wrong how we view the world in itself and that is very traditional tropes that rod sterling was using that are very much tropes in a lot of stories you know even though these stories are sci-fi fantasy in nature there's a lot of meaning and messaging that he's putting in here that you get from you know, stuff you watch, you can watch any TV show and I'm sure glean something that's connected to Twilight Zone oh, and yeah. that kind of, that kind of route, you know, looking back on TV, MASH or All in the Family or anything like that, that <laughs> nature. And I know those are completely different shows, but. Well, no, but they still, yeah. and I think Jacob, when he was on, said it best, like the Twilight Zone above everything else and not in a bad way is, is a, is a series of morality tales. You know, you can take quite that's a few different was, that's things. That's what I was going to use. No, Sorry. that's okay. No, 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 no worries. I mean, <laughs> but I, I think that is, I, I don't always agree with that. I think some episodes are just out there for fun. But yeah, by and large, there are many lessons that you could pull from any one episode. But at the heart of what what's going on, there is a lesson about about humanity and about the 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 thing you should do versus the thing you might do, kind of a thing. So right, right. That does play I mean? in. Yeah, I mean, it's just the concept of a guy having to relive his own nightmare over over his own, oh, yeah. his own, you know, cause and causality is what I don't know, I keep saying that word, but it's the true, fact though, that he keeps, case. yeah, it's funny. You know, how I got cause and causalities from the Matrix Reloaded. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Well, something good came from that then. I like <laughs> that movie. I, I, I get what the architect, <laughs> that whole spiel. I love that spiel. You know, people hate it, but. <laughs> And so just to, to close out this whole episode uh, of this, uh, you know, this episode, Judgment Night, uh, Ross only writes, the queen, the SS Queen of Glasgow heading for New York, and the time is 1942. For one man it is always 1942, and this man will ride the ghost ship every night for eternity. This is what is meant by paying the fiddler. This is the comeuppance awaiting every man with the, with the, when the ledger of his life is opened and examined. The tally made and then the reward of penalty paid. And in the case of Carl Lancer, former Cap Capitan Lieutenant, Navy of the Third Reich, this is the penalty. This is the ju justice metered out. This is the, the this is a judgment night in the Twilight Zone. So basically, this ship is a ship of the <laughs> damned almost in a lot yeah. of aspects. It's a ship At of, least for him. Yeah, I mean, it's a ship where he's always going to have to relive the whole situation over and over and over. And I mean, it says right there, I mean, we talked about how the when you were talking about in the opening the when the captain and stuff like that was talking about how you know the ship and how it feels and stuff like that and it's really interesting that it pops up in the opening narration about ship with the heartbeat and people mm -hmm. and no ledger and stuff like that i thought it was kind of interesting what you were talking about so. well and one thing too that i just got thinking about and it's an obvious thing but mm -hmm. this was only 13 years removed from from 1942 no sorry yeah 19 yeah be 13 years removed from 1932 or 1942 so yeah it's still incredibly fresh i mean it's like the two of us looking back at 9 11 even though it's been 20 years it's still something that was in our lifetime in a time when we can remember it you know as more than just you know a, a little kid so you know it's that you know there is i'm sure at the time this probably dredged up a lot of feelings and a lot of like you know even if it's just like the folks that experienced this or had family that dealt with this. I mean, 
this is I mean, it wasn't removed from that so i think that it's an interesting story to play in honestly when i i read the the synopsis for this but i didn't go very in depth in it so like when it first started up i was thinking oh shit it's it's the titanic and it's like nope nope never mind it's 1942 not not 1912 so right and you can also look at this as kind of a um analogy of what it's like for somebody to for instance be a nazi soldier that didn't necessarily agree but they are unfortunately did what they had to do you know not to you know when they had to kill somebody or something right. like that and living in their own in their own nightmare like constantly having to relive that situation over and over and over and yeah mentally yeah oh 100 percent. i mean you can say that of anyone that served because anyone that's seen any kind of combat there are probably going to be things that they had to do that they regret doing. So yeah, that, yeah, you, that mentally reliving all of that stuff. Right. You hear stories all the time about even now people coming back and just not being the same. And Oh yeah. How could you not after mm. something like that? Well, one kind of interesting thing, and this is kind of unrelated to the like world war two thing, but so at one point, like when, when Lancer like comes back to himself, like when he, when he's on the U boat and, He's talking to his second in command. The second in command says, do you think that there's a second or a special circle or a special place for people that do this kind of thing, you know, in, in hell. And I, I don't have captions on my version of twilight zone, but I, I don't think he actually said hell. I think he kind of muttered it, which for the time obviously was, you know, it was a different, they didn't really swear. They couldn't swear, but yeah. That's that's interesting to think about. I didn't even I honestly didn't even think about that when I was watching it, whether he actually said that or not. Well, and I couldn't hmm. I, I rewind it or, or I, I ran it back a bit to try and see if I could catch it and it I just I couldn't make it out enough. Like it's kind of muttered, but it's not muttered. And it might be it might be muttered because he's trying not to bring that kind of thing down upon things, or maybe he's scared to say it in front of his is it superior, but it kind of still had that sense of there was something more to that whether it was from a sense of perspective or part of the story i'm not sure that's i mean they talk about the thought, devil actually. but i don't think they actually talk about like hell it was uh not warning the people on the boat ship before firing upon them and wonders if we are if we are not all damned now well maybe that's the thing maybe it was damned now instead of not because i i might have just taken it as not like damned to hell or damned now that that's yeah. probably what it was and he says he clarifies that he meant damned in the eyes of God. Ah, oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that must have just been. I apologize that that's on me then. No, I, no, I no. It. It's it's interesting to think about because you have to look at two ways: are they worried about the censors, or are they are, or is this a guy who is worried about his own soul for doing something that will haunt him the rest of his life and possibly into you know his the end of his existence where. Yeah like lancer he repeats i mean it's not necessarily saying that lancer in this episode is actually dead it could be something where he constantly relives the same day over and over he'll be sitting in his chair asleep and this particular thing maybe the people that are, that are on the ship that he sees are not actually the people that are on that ship it's just people maybe imagine a family was on the ship or something like that or he yeah. saw the 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 list of people on the ship and he imagined which brings into the like the end of the episode about you know this guy uh you know a penalty paid in the case of carl answer former captain maybe the third right because this is a penalty this is a justice meted out this is ju judgment night something like that so yeah. uh but maybe it's just kind of a, a a kind of a look upon about a character that is you know you see in his face when he's the when he realizes what he's done maybe that's going to sit with him for the rest of his days and maybe there is a personal hell i don't know but it's it's more interesting than i thought it was going to be so yeah it was very good um one kind of fun piece of trivia i have and this is this is actually kind of like it's it's genuinely just one of those pieces that's like that's a real thing <laughs> why it's that a thing so um a sponsor so one of their main sponsors for this episode almost pulled um because a server asks um them at, asks the people at dinner if they want tea like that was what the original script had said because right. that being it's a british ship traditionally you would have tea served to you mm -hmm. and the sponsor got all up in arms because um they were an instant coffee company and they required them to change the line from tea to coffee 
because they they were incensed over the fact that they would how dare they mention tea when we're a great you know instant coffee people <laughs> it's just so freaking funny it's <laughs> funny it is kind of funny actually and the other thing that i noticed about the episode is a lot of the people have different um uh dialects how they talk yeah a different one was a one was a, i think a uh, irishman a german guy a british guy and another thing kind of popped in my head when i was i, I didn't say anything but it was kind of popping in my head was is this is this about people that were on this ship or is this about the different people that he encountered that maybe he killed and you know and maybe he was in different forms i mean it's just kind of a thought because like i said one guy would sound like he was an irish you know irish gentleman mm-hmm. and some people sounded american some people sounded british and of course he was german so yeah well one thing about it when you're i mean even now if you're crossing from you know england i'm sure whatever i think they left from liverpool which is then at least and i don't know about now but then was a major um port for you know coming to the states so i mean you could have folks that are you know leaving ireland and come or leaving england and coming to the states it could be a lot of things like i don't think multinational cruises or multinational boat trips were Mm -hmm. outside the norm then or now really i mean yeah you look at titanic i mean i'm not talking about the james cameron film but titanic i'm sure had different nationalities and stuff like that so one of my favorite favorite irish bands was playing down in the hold for titanic so they're not dropkick murphy but they're pretty damn awesome so wait was that the actual band that was the name of the well no it was um the band is called gaelic storm but they were like a new band back in the day and they got hired by james cameron to be the the crew or the the band down in the down in the um steering wow you learn something new every day (laughs) it's pretty good i like that if you ever get the chance they're pretty freaking awesome highly suggest them they actually have the music that they played on that on the on the titan or on titanic on one of their first albums so Hmm. you have to send that to me you'll probably forget it (laughs) (laughs) um with that said to kind of close out the episode what was your overall feeling on the episode did you enjoy it did you find you know what was what was your overall take you know overall arching take of the episode i i I feel like it took a little bit long to get from from point a to point b but you're on a ship there's really not a ton to be able to 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 pull it together or to pull like the whole thing together i do agree with you that the 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 big break that they had in there kind of felt a little weird like it was a great kind of point but it didn't really feel cliffhanger-esque um overall I, I thought the episode was good and like the fact that he was so unrepentant when you know he's like writing up the the tonnage of the ship that they that they that they bombed you know yeah. and he's just like ha 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 you know evil laugh I mean everything short of an evil laugh and <laughs> he got his comeuppance in ways that I wouldn't wish on anybody. I mean, having to relive like that level of terror over and over for eternity. I mean, that's, that's a strong punishment. Not saying it's not deserved, but damn, you put yourself in those shoes and it's like, ah, but the rest of the crew, like, obviously he was the main focus, but there wasn't a lot else like character wise that kind of drove this one so much so i mean it was it was a it was an interesting episode i'm glad i watched it it was i I enjoyed it it definitely left me feeling like yeah but i don't know i'm i'm kind of mixed on it yeah i I, i'm gonna be honest i really if it weren't for the ending i would put this at the bottom the ending kind of sells it but the problem with the episode is it's so unbalanced with what is happening at the beginning i know you're not supposed to know a lot but we've seen it in like per chance of death. We've seen it in time enough at last. We've seen it one for the angels to have a good story. You have to give us something in the beginning that makes sense. And all we're getting is just a man that feels out of place, feels weird. You know, there's something that's going to happen. You know, that, ah, catch you, got you type of thing per chance of death. You got to admit, we probably didn't, we didn't really see that coming until the very end of the episode we saw a guy that was having problems and stuff like that and it's the same thing with escape clause we kind of saw coming and stuff like that as well but it's not to that this extent but the thing that saves the episode is just the fact that it's about a guy who's reliving the hell that he created and he's doing it over and over and like i said you look at stuff like white bear you look at stuff like uh like i said we've talked about i'm sure there's other segments and stuff like that and that leads into the next segment where 
where do you put this episode? Because I feel like Mr. Denton on Doomsday is a much better episode, but is it better than the lonely? Is it, I don't know. I feel like the lonely is going to be our kind of sticking point to where the episodes are greater and where the episodes are least. And I'll be honest with you. I really don't like the lonely, but I, I feel this episode is almost maybe just above 16 millimeter shrine and maybe. Wow above where's everybody but i i don't know it's hmm. that's a good question you know uh, like, i definitely I, don't i definitely don't think it's a top five episode no, i can say that much yeah. no as of where things stand i would agree with that i i think hmm, I, I looking at it and you know having you just talk about it i i do think that the pacing wasn't bad and they kind of dulled dulled out information like if we're talking about this from a movie perspective like they dole out a little information at a time to tell you that you get this sense that this guy isn't quite right or he's not where he's supposed to be. And then slowly but surely you kind of build upon that and build upon that. And there's nothing else going around, going out around it. And that's where it really falls down. And then all yeah. of a sudden, boom, at the end, holy crap, look at this damn, you know, that's, that's kind of where it ends up. So had there been other stuff going on around it besides just him, it probably would have been fine. But yeah, I, I'm kind of with you. I, it's mm-hmm. definitely not above escape clause. Um, it kind of does fall. Yeah, I, I think that I think that Denton is better than than this. I think so. I'm kind of with you. So the question is, do you think this episode is better than like Where Is Everybody? I think so. I, I think there's enough. The ending, and obviously, you're talking about the very first episode of the series versus this. But I, I do think that this one, this one. It left me with a sense that was more profound than what um, Whereas Everybody did. And that's not to say like the the sense, like you get the sense that he's all by himself, but it's not until you see him in the capsule where you really get that sense of um, claustrophobia. Whereas with this one, like you get the sense of like dread and there's something not right. And just that sense of, you know, of, of wrongness from the start, really. Yeah, because it's funny because where's everybody? It's an interesting episode, but it literally is just a guy walking through a deserted town and it doesn't really have much to it. I mean, that's what happens in the first episodes, except for yeah. like Lost or something like that. But it's, it, I don't know. I mean, it's interesting that when you start getting into these episodes and you start having to really kind of delve deep into them, where these episodes truly lie on a perspective of just kind of storytelling aspects and how you feel one works after another. It's really kind of crazy. And I hate, you know, I hate ranking sometimes, but it's an interesting way to kind of discuss and kind of break down the episode as a whole. And, you know, it's interesting, but. Yeah, agreed. Um, but yeah, well, I, I will agree with that. I think, you know, right below Mr. Denton on Doomsday, right above where's everybody works. So with that said, um, Judgment Night will be new number eight uh, with Walking Distance still at number one. Uh, 16 millimeter Shrine is still at the bottom at number 10. Hopefully that gets supplanted at some point in our future. <laughs> um, we still have plenty of episodes to talk about. <laughs> um, but we're getting into the next episode we're going to get into is called In the Wind the Sky Was Opened. Very fascinating episode. I, I, I know where this episode is heading, and I, I don't necessarily remember like the piece by piece, but this is an, an episode that has Rod Taylor, an episode that has Charles Aidman, uh, episode has Jim Hutton, Maxine Cooper, directed by Douglas Hayes. Uh, it's based off a Richard Matheson story, which is oh, nice. interesting that he didn't write the screenplay, but this is one of the first ones he's ever done, so... Um, yeah, we'll look forward to that. That'll be the next episode in about a week or so. So with that said, uh, do you have any closing thoughts before we head out? I think we're good. I'm not going to, I'm going to try to avoid, uh, bombing massive boats because that, I I don't really want to spend my eternity, you know, reliving that. What if they have ice cream and pizza? (laughs) Well, even then, I mean, pizza gets old too, so. (laughs) That's true. That's true damn you pizza (laughs) (laughs) okay um so with that said i think we'll end it there uh triv once again this has been fun absolutely Um, happy birthday thank you thank you a week week Uh, late yeah uh, (laughs) yeah, it'll be a week closer to being 40 so there we go uh with that said where can they find you if they want to reach out and touch you uh i don't know that (laughs) i 
I don't want to give that information if that's the case. <laughs> they want to reach out and touch faith, you know? Uh, if you want to reach out and watch my content, uh, you can check me out on YouTube at Trivial Theater. And that's theater with an E-R, not an R-E, although if you Google that up, you'll get it either way. Um, you can also find me on Twitter at Trivia underscore Chick. Awesome, awesome. Oh, and and, uh, oh, and uh, I will, uh, when this goes up, uh, I will have just popped up a really awesome review about Rocky Horror Picture Show. Please do check it out. It's amazing. Um, it should be a lot of fun. And then, yeah, that's that's kind of it. Uh, you just did an episode, <laughs> uh, Scream Blackula Scream, which was pretty awesome. So I just want to shout Lots that out Lots of vampire well, so. puns there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, with that said, uh, you can reach me at uh, Movie Emporium on Twitter. Movie Emporium is my YouTube channel, all that good stuff. Uh, but once again, if you like what you see on this video or if you listen to the audio, remember rate, subscribe, subscribe to the channel, all that good stuff. You know, help us grow this podcast. And uh, yeah, that'll be it. So with that said, we'll see you on the next episode in the Twilight Zone. Peace out, guys.